What's going on you legends? Welcome back to another video. So we have just drove 16 hours to one of, if not the deadliest place here in Australia. I've survived in rainforests. I've survived in the outback. I've survived on uninhabited islands. Now I'm gonna have to survive with monster saltwater crocodiles, six foot prehistoric chickens, some of the most venomous snakes in the world, and koalas. Those things terrify me. Their soft little paws and cute button noses and their delicate, perfectly Just matted do and hair. koalas. This is going to be my craziest adventure to date. So we're actually on an island at the moment and what I thought I'd do is I'd get the drone up in the air and get a lay of the land to see where I'm going to start looking for some deadly animals. So we've just got the drone up in the air at the moment and we're actually on a small island just off the coast of Townsville called Magnetic Island. We've come over here for a couple of days and then we're going to be heading even further up north. We've come here to look for some deadly animals, in particular the common death adder. Now this is a species I've wanted to find for years and I've spent so much time looking for and this island is one of the most densely populated islands that you can find this species here in Queensland. And they really love these rocky escarpments, this real bush area. So I'm just flying the drone around at the moment looking for a place where we can go exploring. These big cliffs here look all right, actually. I say we get the drone back in, head here and see if we can track one down. All right, let's go. So we're just coming around to this little bay that we found with my drone before. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start hiking around it. I know that there's death adders that have been found along this ledge. So we're just gonna go for a bit of an explore, climb some rocks and see if we can find any. There's a freshwater creek not too far from here. So I'm guessing that that's where they'll be drinking out of. Just walking through the bush, looking for death adders, and I've just spotted one of the most iconic animals that we have here in Australia. Take a look at this guy, up in the tree right here. Little koala. So this up behind me right here in this tree is a koala bear. But the thing about them is they're not actually bears, they're marsupials, meaning they raise their young inside a pouch. This guy is so cool, just chilling up there. They spend most of their day sleeping, literally up to 20 hours a day, sleeping in these big gum trees. And then for the rest of it, they eat all day. They've figured out life. So one really cool thing about koalas, in the indigenous language here in Australia, koala means no drink. And it was once thought that they would never have to come out of their trees to drink, which although they do get a lot of the moisture out of these gum leaves, eventually they are gonna have to come down and find water. So you can see this tree that this koala is sitting in at the moment. Now there are over 500 species of gum leaves here in Australia, but these koalas are so picky that they'll only eat about 20 to 30 of them. And that's somewhat the reason why they're endangered because of deforestation, because of urbanization, things like cars hitting them, bushfires, koalas numbers have dropped dramatically over the past couple of years in particular. Look at the little guy staring right into the camera right now. He's like, what's going on? 
They literally look like a teddy bear. You can see why everyone who comes to Australia wants to get a photo with a koala. They've got three layers of fur over their body so that when it rains, they don't actually get wet and cold. The water will just run off them. And they're sitting on tree branches all day with their butt on the actual tree. So to do that, so it's not uncomfortable for them, they got really strong cartilage around their back. And those claws just perfect for climbing trees. One of the coolest animals to see out here. Definitely one of, if not the most, iconic animal that we have here in Australia. Cool to see them out in the wild here. Now, a lot of people think that the reason why these koalas sleep all day is because the leaves get them stoned, but there's just not enough nutrients in eating gum leaves all day. So they have to eat so many, which is why they don't have the energy and why when forests are cleared and all these gum trees get knocked down, that impacts the koalas a lot more than you'd believe. So I'm an ambassador for Queensland Koala Crusaders and they do great work saving these koalas. So if you wanna go check them out, out. I'll link them down below. But we're still on the hunt for death adders at the moment. It's cool to come across some other species on the way. Let's keep going and see if we can find any. Apparently, people get airlifted off this island every week from death adder bites, but after scouring every rocky escarpment and looking under every leaf on the island, I came to the realization that it must all be a lie. Either that, or I just couldn't find any, but I'll be back here soon enough, and next time, I'm gonna close my eyes and feel around with my feet for them. Sadly, time was up here on Magnetic Island. We got on the barge and continued our trip towards the oldest rainforest in the world, looking for one of the most ancient birds to ever exist the giant bush chicken. So, We've just pulled into this little bay right here and what we're tracking right now is literally a living dinosaur. The creature that's leaving these footprints in the sand, which is most likely up that way, is a prehistoric animal that's over six foot tall, an absolutely monstrous bird known as the cassowary. This is a species that I've wanted to find for so long and hopefully right now, we're gonna go walking with dinosaurs. I'm gonna try to track this cassowary down that I know is up the beach somewhere and yeah, hopefully get it up close to the camera. So this is a little freshwater stream running into the ocean and take a look at this big footprint that we got down here. This is one of those prehistoric birds that we're looking for. But seriously, look at the size of that print right there. These are massive animals. They might have actually moved further up into the bush. I think I'm gonna walk up there and try my luck. And it wasn't long until I'd found my first cassowary. And would you take a look at this dinosaur sitting right next to me right now. We are literally walking next to a prehistoric animal. This right here is a giant cassowary. One of the coolest animals and closest relatives we have to dinosaurs up here in North Queensland. Now, a common misconception about these animals is that the mother actually takes care of the young. If you see a cassowary with a small bird walking around, it's actually the male raising the chick until it's big enough to fend for itself. So this is the largest species of bird that we have here in Australia. I remember when I went out west a couple of months ago, I found the second largest species, which was the emu, and I got some really cool footage of that. I'll roll you the clip right now. I've just spotted a massive emu. This is the second biggest land bird that we have in Australia. These guys are literally dinosaurs. He's just shot through these trees right here and I'm pretty sure there's a clearing on the other side. Let me get my drone out and I'll get some shots of him. Yeah look at that. Massive emu. He's just running to this big clearing right now. <laughs> look at it so close. To oh he's just fully attacked my camera. 
and my drone has disconnected. The screen's fully blank. This large chicken has just attacked my camera. I'm gonna go run through the paddock. It's like 150 meters away to try and get it back. So that helmet on the top of this cassowary's head was once thought to help them travel through dense vegetation up here in the rainforest. However, new studies show that it keeps them cool even when it gets so hot up here, offloading heat through it as a thermal radiator and lowering their overall body temperature. The other reason why these animals are endangered is because it's not uncommon to see this species walking on the roads and they've got no protection at all against cars. Coming into this place, we actually saw one walking across the road. I'll roll you some clips. species that have killed people before. They are a dangerous bird. Luckily for me, this guy is very humanized. There's a lot of people around this area, so he's used to them. In the wild, you would not be getting this close to this animal. See the feet that this animal possesses? They will literally slice through you like butter, but this guy's just happy cruising around, eating berries off the floor and everything. So this is an endangered species of animal, primarily due to deforestation, urbanization, things like wild pigs. A lot of the non-native species have had an impact on these animals. They're only found up north here in Queensland. So to see one down at this little bay like this is so cool to me. After that amazing experience with such an impressive bird, we decided to go look for another endangered species on our way through the Atherton Tablelands. So I'm just walking through the rainforest up here in far north Queensland at the moment looking for Australia's largest tree dwelling mammal. This is a rare species of marsupial found all across the Atherton Tablelands up into Papua New Guinea. So we're going to be looking for it today in this dense rainforest. Hopefully we can find my first ever tree kangaroo and get it on camera. So we've been walking through the bush for about half an hour. We still haven't found one of these tree kangaroos, but what we're looking for is anything abnormal up in the canopy. With a bit of luck, All right. I reckon we'll be able to find one. If I come through here, I should be able to get a shot of it. Look at that. This is my first tree kangaroo that I've ever seen in the wild. So to be able to come out here, onto the Atherton Tablelands and find one of these guys is so cool. They're a hard species to find up here. They are an endangered species. And this looks like a big female sitting up in the tree. She might even have a joey sitting in her pouch. Just gonna get some good shots of her while she's sitting out there. The reason why these animals are so hard to find out here is because like the koala and like the cassowary which we have found in this video, deforestation and urbanization makes a massive impact on all of these species. And if you think about it, these are just three animals that have all been affected by it. So we do have to do something. Look at this beautiful, pristine rainforest and habitat for these animals. Why cut it down to build houses when we know that there's so many animals living here and depending on this habitat to survive? So these tree kangaroos are absolute masters of climbing and spend most of their lives up there in the canopy. So they're macropods and what macropods are is they're plant eating mammals. And millions of years ago, the ancestors of macropods, the family of marsupials that includes kangaroos and wallabies, descended from the trees. But one group of macropods known as tree kangaroos eventually returned to that arboreal life. And that's what we're looking at right now, a tree kangaroo sitting up there in the tree.
Actually, there's two of them up there. Two tree kangaroos. I didn't even see the second one. We found some cool species on the way up to the Cape and just stopping in at all these rainforests, finding things like koalas, cassowaries, and tree kangaroos. This is one of the coolest trips I've done with so many different species. But out of all of these cool species that I've found so far, what I'm getting really excited for is the crocodiles. We're a day away from seeing some massive salties. I've never seen big saltwater crocodiles in the wild. So to get out there, get amongst it and film them is gonna be so cool because like the cassowaries and like these other animals that I've been finding, they're true living dinosaurs. These are the closest thing to dinosaurs that we have here in the wild, let alone here in Australia. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting. I'm a bit nervous, but it's gonna be awesome to film. She's got a baby. She's got a baby that's just come out of her pouch. And I'm getting all of this on camera right now. That's crazy. It's rare enough to see these guys in the wild anyways, let alone two of them, let alone another baby as well. That's what you get when you come out here looking for animals like that. So we still have a long road trip ahead of us. We're heading up to the Cape tomorrow. I say we leave these tree kangaroos alone keep walking through the bush, see what else we can find. And if not, tomorrow we'll hit the road early and find some crocodiles. Look at that. I don't know if there's anything creepier than that. That is like, Seriously creepy. This is a centipede. They are a venomous species. You would not want to get bitten by it And I'm just debating if I should even put it on myself You can see they've got a very streamlined body with 21 or 23 pairs of legs and this body allows them to get into little crevices looking for food They're commonly found in sheltered places like logs under soil Rocks pieces of bark and they're under there feeding on insects worms sometimes even small reptiles We actually used to have heaps of these at our old house and not even joking one time while I was having a shower a huge centipede probably about three times the size of this one crawled out of the drain like in between my feet it's weird knowing that this thing on me right now could cause me such a painful bite here we go show it to you a bit better take a look at that Big centipede. Wow. All right, I'm gonna put him down. So yeah, let's start flipping some rocks and logs and see if we can find anything. Oh, look at that. Little echidna. Haven't found one of them in ages. Look at that, big scorpion. I'm pretty sure that's a rainforest scorpion. Let's get him out. And would you take a look at this guy right here? So this is the venomous rainforest scorpion. That's just crazy, hey? I haven't caught many scorpions over my years. So to find one up north here is so cool. Big rainforest scorpion cruising across my hand. What a beautiful species, man. So this isn't a full grown animal. They do get a bit bigger than this, but what a weird, weird looking creature. Honestly, I used to be a bit scared of like all these spiders, centipedes and everything, but the more that I've got myself to film with them, the more amazed I have been by this species. Might as well put the little dude on my face. So that, is the rainforest scorpion sitting on my face right now. All scorpion species are venomous, but the venom varies from species to species. The toxicity of this venom in particular isn't too bad. It'd probably feel like a bee sting if I got stung. And he can sense movement. We're currently heading deep into Cape York on the hunt for some big saltwater crocodiles. We've brought the tinny out here with us. There's actually crocodiles in this river that are much bigger than this three and a half meter tinny. And we're gonna be trying to track them down on this trip. Welcome to the Cape, let's get into it. So 
if you have a look here over these grassy plains, as far as the eye can see, there's these big sculpture-like things. And what these are is they're termite mounds. There are literally thousands of them across these plains, some of them reaching well up over 15 foot in height. If you look across this area, you'll actually notice that all these termite mounds are facing the same direction. These termites will build these mounds running north and south, mysteriously aligned to the Earth's magnetic field to help keep a constant temperature inside the mound. Another cool thing about these termites is they actually build these nests by chewing up dirt and actually placing it onto this big mound. But yeah, it's just another awesome thing that we have here in Australia that you can find when you come out to places like this here in the outback. So after making it to our campsite deep in the Aussie bush, we spotted a massive floodplain about 500 meters from where we set up. So we decided to go for a mission on foot and try to find some saltwater crocodile nests. So what happens is during the wet season here in far north Queensland, there'll be so much rain causing the main river to rise up and fill these floodplains with water. And that's when the big female salties will venture up here looking for a good place to build a nest and lay her eggs. Now as the wet season finishes and the water resides, big female crocs can actually get caught out and trapped within these floodplains and we're walking through knee deep water more than enough to hide a big croc but hopefully with a bit of luck we can find some hatched crocodile eggs. So we're just walking out here in this swamp and we found our first crocodile nest. This is actually so cool you can see where these crocodiles have actually hatched out of all these shells down here on the floor. So with this nest here uh, what the female crocodiles will do is they'll scratch up a big mound of dirt and vegetation and as it decomposes that's what creates the heat inside to incubate the eggs like a big compost. Typically they lay about 40 to 60 eggs inside of a nest like this. Uh, these eggs here we're not sure if they've actually hatched out or not. Uh, it's possible a pig or a goanna has actually come in and eaten them. So the temperature inside the nest will actually determine if it's a male or a female crocodile. It's only a very short window of time, uh, not through the whole incubation period. Usually the hotter the nest, the quicker those eggs will develop. It takes about 80 to 90 days for those little crocodiles to hatch out. Typically mum's hanging around this little area guarding the nest and then she'll hear the crocodiles actually say, Mm, mm, mm. They make that little call. It's an instinctive response for that crocodile to come up onto the nest and then she'll start to scratch it open and she'll help persuade them out of the eggs and then they'll hang around an area like this or she'll take them to a deeper area of the river, wherever that might be, and she'll keep an eye on them for up to eight to nine months maybe before the next nesting season will come in. Got another nest just over here. Being very careful, just in case mama croc sitting around here. Yeah, that's what they do. They just build it up on vegetation and then it just floats. So as water levels come up, the nest doesn't actually drown. That's the other egg chamber there. Yeah, I don't think these hatched out. Look at that. Yeah, right. So they didn't hatch. Yeah, there's a fair few of them in there. Look at that. But that is a crocodile egg. The sun's just setting over the cape right now. We're setting up camp for the night. We might go for a bit of a night walk, see if we can eye shine any crocodiles because we know they're down in this creek system. But yeah, I'm keen for tomorrow. It's gonna be a big day. We spent all day traveling out here. So to get a good sleep, chill around the fire and see what we can find later on is gonna be really cool. But yeah, it feels good to be out here in Cape York. And this little fella right here is my first Cape York crocodile, a juvenile salty. They're a completely different animal to the big crocodiles that are found in this river. But it is crazy to think that this bloke could reach lengths of over five meters one day.
We're just creeping up on a decent freshwater croc right now. This is the other species of crocodile that lives here in this river. Believe it or not, this guy would be out there hunting those little salties that we saw earlier. And this is my first wild freshwater croc. We have seen some big crocs tonight, but they're so hard to get close to. I think we might head back to camp and try our luck in the morning. Yep. Oh. He took it for a second there. There we go. What's that? Archerfish. <laughs> Little archerfish. These guys will actually spit water out of their mouths and hit bugs up in the tree to make them fall in the water and they'll eat them. There's so many in here, but we're after Barra, so. Chuck this guy back in. There we go. Yep. Oh. Oh, it's a catfish. Uh. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. Yep. Oh, yes. Yep. Yes. Oh, I dropped oh, him. No. no get it back oh. <laughs> Is there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got That's one. Right. <laughs> Slab of gold. There's another one down there too. I saw it. Hold her up. <sighs> nice Not little barra for the morning. <laughs> so that's what these crocodiles would be feeding on. Yeah. Yeah. And. A barra this size could actually eat a little crocodile as well, so it goes yeah. both ways. True. Yeah. Let's get it back in there. Yeah. Oh, oh. That was the one with my lure in its mouth. Oh, you, your, your lure in his mouth. I just spat it. It's right there, it's floating. All right. So this, just down here, is the first snake of the trip. One of the coolest species to find, whoa, out in this creek system. The crazy thing about it is literally 10 meters over that way, there's a creek with crocodiles in it. There could be a big croc sitting right there. Where are you going? See, if I calm down, this snake will calm down as well. They're a non-venomous species. No fangs, no venom. What's he doing? Hey buddy, crawling right over my arm, coming here. Look at that, what a beauty. But yeah, it's day two of being out in the Cape at the moment. It's crazy to think that there's a living dinosaur somewhere in this creek system right here. So far, we've found crocodile eggs, crocodile nests, baby crocodiles, and now we're gonna try to track down some big salties today. Get them on camera, we're actually heading out in the boat. So let's jump in the car, get out there, and see what we can find. So we've just come across this black-headed python. We're on the way to look for some crocs and he was just sitting on the side of the road. Just had a real go at me then. Perfectly built for areas like this where it gets so hot and because they do have predators out here, big wedgetail eagles, dingoes, wild cats, all of that kind of stuff wants to have a go at this guy. And you see that black head that they got at the front there. So what they'll do is these guys primarily live in little tree hollows, fallen logs on the floor, and they can actually stick their head out of the hollow. And since black is the color that absorbs the most heat, they can warm up their whole body for the day. 
All reptiles are cold-blooded. The one that we're looking for next, a crocodile, is also cold-blooded. So we're trying to spot them out in the bank as well. But it's cool to see all these other species on the way to hunt for that dinosaur. So yeah, we're gonna let this little guy go because if I'm not careful, he's definitely gonna whack me on the face in a second. And would you take a look at this massive guana right down in front of me right here. So we were just driving along the road here and my mate saw him so he stopped the cars. And the cool thing about these creatures is they have to choose fight or flight. And this guy is so big that he's chosen to defend himself, stand up like that, make himself as big as possible because this guy is the king out here. Those croc eggs that we found in the nest yesterday, we think that the guanas like this might have actually gotten into the nest last season and eaten them. So what he's doing right, is he's flicking his tongue out back and forth and these guys have forked tongues and they'll actually put their tongue back in their mouth and wherever the strongest scent is on each side of their tongue, that's how they'll decide where their food is, where they wanna go and what he's doing now by flicking his tongue out is seeing if I'm a threat or not. These guys are actual dinosaurs. But what we're looking for now, will eat a goanna like this if it swims across the creek. So we're gonna keep heading and see if we can find any crocs. As soon as we got down to the river, Brody and I were pretty keen to launch the boat and try spot some big salties sitting on the banks. You can actually see that Brody's welded some big bars on the back of his boat so he can't get grabbed by a big salty off the back of it. But yeah, let's head up the river and see if we can find any. We're just creeping up on the first decent croc of the trip. We launched the boat, got out here. I'm gonna get my big camera up and try to get some footage of them. So this is the saltwater crocodile, the biggest reptile in the world, reaching lengths of over six meters long. So there are two species of crocodiles that live here in this river, the freshwater crocodile and this guy right here, the salty. Now, although it's called a saltwater crocodile, don't be fooled by the name because these big guys can be found up in fresh water. In fact, this place that we're in right now is fresh water, so this crocodile is living in it. But yeah, these are true dinosaurs, an animal that's the top of the food chain up here in North Queensland, and something that you do have to be careful of. Unfortunately, there has been fatalities of people up here in North Queensland and around this area in particular. So in this section of river here, in the late 2000s, there was actually a, a crocodile fatality. A bloke came down with his kayak and was kayaking this section of river, and uh, a crocodile about five metres long actually snatched him from the back of the kayak. Uh, you've got to be very crocwise in areas like this. Stay back from the water about five metres and don't go kayaking or swimming in the water. That's where most people become unstuck with crocodiles. And after cruising further up the river, it wasn't long until we'd found another salty sitting up on the bank. In the 1940s, 50s and 60s, crocodiles were actually hunted very severely across the top end of Australia for skins and meat, and it was uncontrolled hunting. So anyone could go out with a gun and a boat and shoot them for a living or as a hobby. They protected the species in the late 1960s and early 70s, and what we're seeing now is about 50 years of protection of the crocodiles. So we're seeing an increase in numbers, but they're plateauing. So in places like the Northern Territory, they're not increasing or decreasing anymore. They're a natural level the environment will sustain. Here in Queensland, we probably quite haven't seen that plateau yet. In a few more years, we probably will. And that's when we find crocodiles turning up in places uh, close to people where they've just developed houses or agriculture and whatnot, and people come into conflict with crocodiles. So we were just walking up this riverbank and we noticed this big croc slide. Normally, it wouldn't be this dug out if it was an actual croc slide. So what we think is that a big female has come up here, made a nest, laid some eggs, so we're just gonna go check it out. And I can see a nest just over there right now. Yeah, look at this. So these 
are all crocodile eggs, which would have hatched out a couple of months ago. You can see this big mound that the females made. It's crazy to think that at one point there was a three metre croc sitting right where I am right now, guarding these eggs. So some of them, like this one is hatched out, but these ones down here still have the embryo inside of them. So what I'm thinking is maybe some wild pigs came through here, tore up the nest while the mother was down in the water and couldn't hear them. But yeah, so cool to see wild crocodile eggs out here in the Cape. So we were just walking this stream that runs out of the main creek that we've been seeing these crocs at and we found this big broad shell turtle who's just crossing from pool to pool. Now believe it or not, the big salties will actually feed on these turtles, crunch the shell with that incredible bite power that they have. So the big crocs that are in this river, the big four to five meter salties, can crunch this turtle shell with three to five thousand pounds per square inch. It's pretty much like a car dropping on top of you. So these turtles, even though they've got a bit of protection on their back, stand no chance for these big salties. He's about to go for a bit of a move, back up into the pool from this little pool over here. Here we go. After seeing how many big salties were in this one stretch of river, we decided to take the boat out spotlighting them after dark. So we just launched the boat, came out here on the river at night. What we're doing now is we're spotlighting crocodiles. So these crocs eyes, when you put a flashlight on them, it'll actually glow red. So we're just cruising down the river, seeing if we can see any. There's a lot of small crocs out, so I'm keen to get some of them on camera. But yeah, how cool is this? Croc infested creek, cruising down it in a little tinny, see if we can find anything. Yep, so we just got a little salty up here on the bank over here. We're gonna cruise over and get some shots of it. Look at this, little saltwater crocodile sitting here, probably eating some little fish, maybe frogs. It's crazy to think that maybe one day this guy could be a five meter monster. Let's see if we can find anything else. juvenile crocodiles that we're seeing tonight would have hatched out this season the nest that we were finding that would be from these same sets of crocodiles and there's so many little ones that we're seeing in the river at the moment so it's cool to see that there's a good population of them and a lot of them hatched and actually made it to the water So it's been a really cool night, spotlighting crocodiles. We're gonna head back to camp now and continue the adventure tomorrow. How cool is that? So my main goal on this Cape York trip was to film a four plus meter saltwater crocodile because that to me is a monster croc and that's something that I've always wanted to see in the wild. So on our final morning of the trip, we went to check out a small section of river that we hadn't explored yet. And it wasn't long until we'd found signs that there was a big croc in the area. So we were just walking up this creek and what we found right here is a massive croc slide. Now you can see where he's been digging his feet in and actually moving from a pool down there to this pool up here. All along here, and you can see this massive footprint. This is his back foot right here. There's his toes at the front and the massive pad at the back there. Literally look at that thing. We're estimating that this could be a four meter crocodile. And he's gone straight from this sand bank into this little pool right here. So we're gonna get the drone up in the air and see if we can find him. So we just got the drone up in the air. 
And it's crazy to think that somewhere in this pool is a four plus meter crocodile. And you wouldn't think it either. The river that we were going up in the boat, that's where you'd imagine a big croc to be. Not these little cut off pools, but that just proves that there are big crocodiles around here and you do have to be careful even in places like this. Yeah, look at this creek system that we're flying through right now. So cool. There we go. Big crocodile sitting on the, two big crocodiles sitting on the bank up the end here. Take a look at that. These things are monsters. There's one really big one here and that's the croc that this slide would have been from. So this is the largest species of crocodile in the world, the saltwater crocodile, and they have been known to reach lengths of over six meters long. They are true prehistoric dinosaurs and we're lucky enough to live with them here in Australia. But you do have to be careful, you do have to be croc wise. If you follow all the right steps, you will not get eaten by a crocodile. It's as simple as that. Stay away from the water. Even in little pools, assume that there's a big crocodile sitting in them. Don't go swimming, kayaking, and just be aware of these true dinosaurs that we're lucky enough to live with. They are one of the oldest creatures to ever walk the planet, dating back 240 million years. They have kept almost the exact same appearance because, well, why, why change if you don't need to? These guys are killing machines and they're perfectly built for an environment like this. I have so much respect for crocodiles and it's weird because I live on the sunny coast, which is about 20 hours down south and we don't have to worry about anything like crocodiles down here. So coming up to an environment where the rules are completely different, you have to start thinking in a different mindset when you get up here. If I saw a turtle in the creek down in the sunny coast, I'd be jumping on it, but I have to hold myself back here. So the crocodiles we just seen on the drone, they're actually basking now. They have to bask to maintain their body temperature. We're what you call endotherm, so we eat a lot of food all the time to sort of maintain our constant body temperature. Crocodiles have to do it through an external source. So when they get too hot, they go in the water, too cold on a day like today, this is cold in far north Queensland, they're gonna be up on the banks trying to warm up in the sun. Now one of the biggest issues with people and crocodiles is people actually interacting with them and feeding them. And when you feed a crocodile, it loses its fear of people and it starts associating people or camps with boat ramps with food and, uh, and it approaches them, it becomes a very dangerous animal. Those crocodiles often get shot or relocated to uh, a crocodile park, uh, but most of the time in these remote areas, unfortunately, the animal is euthanized. They used to relocate them years ago, but the problem about crocodiles is they have magnetoreceptors in their inner ears, so they can actually come back to the original capture site. For an example of this, they caught a crocodile many years ago on the west coast of Cape York. They flew it by helicopter to the east coast and within a, bit, a couple of months that crocodile had swum all the way around the tip of Australia back within 100 metres of where it was first caught from. Some crocs do it, some crocs don't, but the majority of relocated crocodiles will come back from the studies that they've done. Yeah, I'm just gonna follow these guys around for a bit, bring the drone back in and continue the adventure. That's actually so cool. And that is part two of my North Queensland adventure. I just wanted to say a massive thanks to my mate Brody for taking me out there. He's a legend, he's worked with Crocs for years, knows everything about them, and I couldn't have asked for a better person to take me out and show me some big salties. So here's his Instagram up on the screen right now if you wanna go check him out, and I'll no doubt be up North Queensland again soon doing some more filming with him. If you didn't tune into part one, we filmed some crazy animals in that video as well, so it's up on my channel right now, 
now, go check it out. My life lately has been really exciting. I've been so content with filming videos, traveling, going on road trips like this, finding all these amazing species and having a platform like YouTube where I can show you all my adventures. I love making videos and I would love to be making them for a long time. So if you want to support me, you can leave a comment down below, like this video, subscribe to the channel. And yeah, thank you so much. I'll see all you legends next weekend in the next adventure.